Now the first reading is taken from Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 to 31. And this is all about the wife of noble character. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honour her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. A second reading comes from James chapter 3 and 4. Who is wise and an understanding among you? Let them show it by their good deed by a good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Submit yourselves to God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. If you're able to, I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. Praise and glory to God. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum, where he, when he was in the house, He asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about 
who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he had placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. This is the Gospel of Christ. Please be seated. Heavenly Father, just be with us this morning as we delve into your word and try, Lord, to learn your will for our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so, speaking about God's economy and uh, to understand what we're talking about with God's economy, I guess the first thing we need to do is understand um, who God is so that we can understand how we're supposed to respond to that. Once we've accepted the free gift of salvation, what is it that we're supposed to do next? What is our part in furthering God's kingdom, living in God's economy, essentially? So today's gospel shows us a lovely picture of both our part and God's part. Now, as they're traveling along the road, even though Jesus is talking to them, the disciples, about the fact that he's going to die and then be resurrected, the disciples are not paying too much attention to this because they're busy squabbling about who's going to be the greatest or who is the greatest. They get to their destination and Jesus calls them together to sit down. And he says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. So that's our part. I'll talk to you a bit more about that because at the moment it doesn't sound that exciting. Um, but then he takes a little child who he places among them. He takes the child in his arms and he says to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. Um, and now this reading came from the Gospel of Mark but there's a, the same event in Matthew's Gospel. And he says... Um, at that time, Matthew's account says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And another time he said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. What is it with Jesus and little children? Why does he seem to want so badly for us to be like them? What, so what is it that, that gives them ownership in the kingdom of heaven? Now, you know, some, sometimes people get the impression that, well, because they're so young, therefore they haven't really done much in the way of um, sin. But I think those of you that have been, or our parents, or grandparents, will know that even a little child can be just quite naughty, um, as we can be quite naughty or wicked as well. So it's not about their purity or sinless. Um, now, one thing that Jesus says is, you know, this child has a humble and a lowly position, and so part of that message is we need to be content with our humble position. Um, in fact, if we're to be the servant of all, as Jesus showed us, um, he showed us how he, to be servant of all, he washed the feet of his disciples, and then he died for us all on the cross. So that's what servitude looks like. But the important bit here is not our part, but it's God's part. And the child illustration is used because it shows us God as the loving parent. So we are the child and God is the loving parent. Our place in God's kingdom doesn't depend on who we are or what we've done. It depends on who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Jesus is pointing out that the way small children trust their parents to take care of them, that is the way that we can trust our God to take care of us, only more so, because not in a healthy family, a little child doesn't worry about 
what's for dinner or what, you know, will dinner be provided or who's going to pay the power bill or anything like that, the child is able to trust their parents to provide for them. But of course that's not the case in all families because our parents are human parents. We're human parents. But our parent, as Christians, our parent is the creator of the universe and his love for us is infinite. The Bible tells us this in many different places. All three of the Synoptic Gospels have accounts of a specific event where Jesus talks more about this. And I know that you all know this passage. Jesus says, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not so much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But first seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek him first and he'll take care of everything else. Now just to be clear, this isn't about punishment and reward. If we do a good job of seeking him, then he'll reward us. That's not what it's about. If a child runs away from home, the parent can no longer look after the child. If we want God's blessings in our lives, we must be in a place where he can bless us. If we're outside of God's will, that creates a barrier between us and him. The further away we get from God's will, the less permeable, the, the thicker and harder to break through that barrier is. When Jesus walked on the water, Peter saw him from the boat and he called out, Lord, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus did that. He said, come, come to me, Peter, on the water. And, and Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the waves. And it was only when he was distracted by, by the, the storm and the heavy weather and, and the waves all around him that he stopped looking at Jesus and then he began to sink. And Jesus said to him, why did you doubt? When we lose fat focus on the Lord, we immediately get confused about what we want and what we need and how we should be living our lives. We might be overcome by anxiety or tempted into an unsound lifestyle. At that point, we need to stop and hand everything to God again and sit still and trust him. Um, you, I think most of you know that Phil is not my first husband. Um, and my first marriage broke up when my daughter was about three. And so I was a, a single mother for about 10 years. And you know, when, uh, when you're single, pe people want to set you up with somebody else. They, or, every, or, you, or your married friends feel as if you ought to be married as well. And so I, you know, I dated this guy and that guy, and, and nothing seemed quite right. And so I finally said to the Lord, look, Lord, if you want me to be married again, then that guy is going to have to walk up the footpath and ring the front doorbell. Um, so I, 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 I gave it to God. And well, a, a couple of months later, that's exactly what happened. Phil walked up the, the footpath and rang the front doorbell. And uh, I think we both knew straight away that that, uh, that was it, we were going to be together. And uh, so sit still and trust him, give him a chance to look after you. And keep in mind that God is a good father. He, so he's not going to give us things that aren't good for us. He loves us and he wants what is best for us. Now sometimes what we want is not best for us. Um, if your nine-year-old asks you if he can have a couple of sharp knives out of the drawer in the kitchen so he can play sword fights with his little brother, you probably won't give them to him. A good parent probably wouldn't, definitely wouldn't. And the Lord sometimes deals with us that same way. We ask for things that are not good for us and we don't get them. And of course, his priorities are not the same as ours. And James says, um, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you, spend what you get on your pleasures. He doesn't have a very high opinion of us, does he? If we ask for selfish reasons, God won't bless us. But God longs to give us the desires of our hearts if they're right for us. 
Sometimes God disciplines us or prunes us, reducing our dependency on worldly things so that we learn to depend more on him. Many of us have great difficulty in letting go and letting God, as the saying goes. We live in a society where we're urged to take control, put ourselves first, make long-term plans, and put our trust in KiwiSaver. Some of the trouble with this idea of trusting God to take care of us might be because our, our image of a parent isn't necessarily of a strong and loving person who's going to look after us. Not all of us have had great experiences with parents. So here are a few things to remember about God. He is the creator of the entire universe. He is infinitely powerful. Nothing is too hard for him. He owns everything, the heavens, the earth, and everything in it, including our house, our car, and our savings account. The things that we think are our possessions do not belong to us. They belong to God. He, you know, our bodies heal. Again, that, the Lord heals us. And we, we're so, you know, we just take it for granted a lot of the time. He has control of everything, including difficult situations and circumstances. Um, some of you might know that Phil and I are homeless at the moment, and we have been since the beginning of April. But we know God is in control, and the situation won't go on forever. Although I must tell you, we don't love being homeless. Um, but we have learnt, this is helping us to learn, to count our blessings and be thankful for the things that he's showing us. The, loving, the love of our kind friends and deeper relationships with them, learning to trust more in him, and dare I say it, a little bit more patience. Uh, so we wish that we didn't need to learn those lessons, but, but apparently we do. And so, and so we're, we're committing those things to God. God's kingdom is at hand, another thing to remember about God. It's not, you know, pie in the sky by and by. God's kingdom is here and now. It's right here. You don't have to wait until you die to experience living in God's kingdom. Now, we live in a fallen world, and there's a lot of bad stuff that goes on around us, but we can still run to the Lord, and he'll take care of us. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways are higher than ours. We can't always understand why he does things or allows things to happen. Some things we will never understand this side of the pearly gates. His priorities aren't the same as ours. When someone dies, God doesn't say, oh no, how terrible. It's a natural and often a desirable outcome. The person moves from this life to um, the next and much better chapter of their life. We're sad because we've lost them, but that doesn't make it a crisis. God is utterly reliable. He is faithful. He keeps his promises. He always shows up. He knows you and he loves you and he made you to be the way that you are. Every part of it. And he has a wonderful plan for your life. And he wants to look after you as his beloved child. I haven't quoted the scriptures, but all of those things are in the Bible. Most of them in more than one location. Now, our relationship with God is not one of equals. He is the creator and the master of the universe, and we are his created ones. But he loves us so much that he gives us free will, even though he knows that we're going to make a mess of things. We're not robots controlled by compulsion. We get to decide whether or not we want to obey him or even acknowledge him. That's our choice. He doesn't force, us, force it on us. When we do obey, we find ourselves living in God's will, and that is the place where he can bless us, where he provides abundantly for all of our needs, whether we know it or not. 
And the Lord did not design people to carry responsibilities that only he is up to. Obedience is usually not onerous. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But he says, come to me. Don't, he doesn't say, try to sort it out yourself. If we find ourselves in a place where the things, are, things are not going the way that we think they should, we need to consider whether we are where God wants us to be. Instead of trying desperately to solve whatever we believe is the problem, maybe burning out in the process, we'd be better to prayerfully submit ourselves to the Lord and sincerely ask him to show us the next step. If we begin with prayer, we can save ourselves an awful lot of running around in circles. There's no such thing as being too busy to pray. I would suggest that all of us are maybe too busy not to pray. We can be absolutely certain that when we are in God's will, doing what he wants us to do, everything we need will be provided. There's no if about that, that's a certainty. Sometimes we don't see the full picture until many years later, if ever. Um, when I was a kid growing up, we lived in the United States for, for quite a while, and um, many years later, in 2015, my dad, in his, in his 80s, came back to live with us, and if you live outside New Zealand for very long, then, then your um, super goes away. And, and so Phil took Dad to apply for Social Security, and it turned out that if you work in the United States for more than 10 years, then they'll pay you Social Security once you reach the, the age. And Dad had worked in the US for th 10 years and three months. At the time, he had no thought of working long enough to qualify for Social Security but it gave him the income that he needed. We are all called to serve. We are all called to be servants. If we are living in God's will, obedient to God, we are, are serving. All, every one of us is a member of the body of Christ and the body of Christ exists to serve other members of the body. You know, each of us has a role, and, and I, I have a conversation with Phil sometimes that, you know, even though we're retired, that the Bible doesn't actually say anything about retirement. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt at age 80, and then led them around the desert until he was 120. If you feel that you're to a point in your life where really physically there's not much you can do, I would just say to you that one of the most important and the most neglected works of the church is prayer. And some of us are called to intercede for others every day. God has important work for you to do. It's work that will strengthen you and bless you, not work that will exhaust you. If you're exhausted, you might be doing somebody else's work. Maybe they need to step up. To enjoy the blessings of life in God's kingdom here and now, you must obediently serve as he calls you. Now, it's not necessarily easy to discern God's plan for your life, but I know from his word and my own experience and that of many others that if we earnestly seek him, we will find him and he will shed enough light on the path for us to take the next step. We might not be able to see the, the final destination, but he, there's enough light for the next step. I just want to end with a beautiful picture from today's psalm of how God intends our relationship with him to work. It says, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Would you please turn to page 413 in your red prayer box? Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear when we pray.
in the name of your Son. Therefore, in confidence and trust, we pray for the church. We ask your blessing on this congregation here this morning. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, encourage us and be with all our parishioners who are unable to be here to worship this morning. Father, enliven the church for its mission, that we may be salt of the earth and light. Breathe fresh life into your people. Give us power to reveal Christ in word and action. We pray for the world. We lift up all people in the Ukraine, Russia, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Iran, and Sudan. Bring peace in these war-torn countries and give world leaders wisdom to settle disputes in a peaceful and humanitarian way. Creator of all, lead us and every people into ways of justice and peace, that we may respect one another in freedom and truth. Awaken in us a sense of wonder as spring arrives for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. We pray for the community, especially families who are struggling with high rents, mortgages, the cost of power, food and petrol. Guide and bless those working in budgeting services Caps, Hauraki, and Citizens Advice. Bless the Monday Kai program and all those who receive meals. God of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. We pray for those in need. We pray, Lord, for those who face difficulties in their personal lives. We bring before you those who are unwell and those recovering from illness. We pray for those who are caregivers who need a break or more support. Give us all grace to share in their healing and encouragement. And we pray for all those people who are on our pew sheet this morning. Reverend Lillian Barrett, the Broken Shire family, Fiola, Lynn Chamley, Claire Twentyman, Ted and Jill Egan, Mator Toko and Fire Ellen, Alan Judd, Reverend David, Reverend Chris, Vivian, Elsa, Philippa, Shirley, Justin, Reuben, Lois, Robert Barlow, Beth and Christina, the Sarsfield family, the Armstrong family, Murray Hayhurst, the Mackay family, the Eccles family, the Connor family, the Baker family, the Hugh family, the Gill family and the Finnan family. And we bring before you Natasha, Kayla and Murray and Shane this morning. And we pray for healing for Kayla and Natasha this morning. God of hope, Comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen as we share, making people whole. We remember those who have died and those who mourn. Grant rest and peace to those who have died recently and we bring their families before you for your comfort and peace. And we remember with thanksgiving those who have died in the faith of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Father, into your hands we commend them. 
Give comfort to those who mourn. Bring them peace in their time of loss. We praise you for all your saints who have entered your eternal glory. May their example inspire and encourage us. We pray for ourselves and our ministries, for our upcoming community dinner this week. We ask for your strength and encouragement through your Holy Spirit for our next Alpha course, for our Thrive Bible study, and for all those doing hospital and home visiting. Bless Brendan, Lord, as he ministers to the bereaved, the housebound, and the sick. We thank you for our Monday Kai program and ask that more people will help us cook the meals. Lord, you're always with us. Help us to be more aware of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And we'll close now with the prayer on 415. Your word is a lamp to our feet. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, Help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love, to serve your purpose, and to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.